Okay, very good. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me uh, and good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event hosted by the Energy Institute, focusing in on the Orion project. My name is Hannah Mary Goodlad and I'm the Vice Chair of the Energy Institute Aberdeen Highlands and Islands Branch. The second thing that I can share is that I work for Equinor and I head up the offshore wind area development within the Baltic Sea. But the most important thing to share with you on an evening when we're talking about Shetland is that I'm also a proud Shetlander. And so the Orion project is, is very important to me in terms of what it could mean for Shetland and our folk. So before we get started, a couple of very quick housekeeping items. Number one, please remember to mute. And number two, please put any questions that you have to the panel uh, in the chat box. It appears that the chat box isn't working tonight, so I'm actually going to ask people uh, at some point in time to raise their hand when they do have a question, but we'll come back to that. So alongside so the if everyone can mute and then I won't hear a, a, an echo when I speak. Alongside me here tonight, I have an excellent panel who are all experts in their own right. Firstly, we have Emma Swergon, uh, a project engineer from the OGTC, who started her career as a safety consultant, but moved to the OGTC at the beginning of 2020. Emma works within the Energy Systems Unit and is developing three main technologies with huge growth potential, offshore renewables, hydrogen and carbon capture. Secondly, we have Gunter Newcomb, who is the Orion Project Coordinator. And Gunter has over 40 years of deep knowledge in the energy sector. For 35 years of that, he worked in BP across the full value chain, taking on senior leadership roles within exploration right through to decommissioning. Latterly, he took on the operations director role at the Oil and Gas Authority. And then at the beginning of 2020, took on this pivotal role within Project Orion as the coordinator. And last, but by no means least, we have Douglas Irving, who is the future energy director at the Shetland Islands Council. Now Douglas heads up the council's future energy unit, which has the mandate to identify routes for Shetland to make that switch from fossil fuel dependency to a greener uh, technology future whilst ensuring a just transition for Shetland, with people and social benefits at the heart of any decision making. Douglas has worked for over 35 years in the Council, holding senior leadership roles within the economic and business development units. The style of tonight's session is, is simple and we wanted to make it interactive. So we're going to have a quick fire presentation round from our three speakers, then we'll dive into a Q&A session. Now, as I said, the chat function isn't working. So what we'll do is I'll ask a few questions first to our panel. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll come to you. And then at that point, you can put on your video, unmute yourself and ask a question. The final part of this event is where we want to hear from you. So we understand that on this call, there is a deep wealth of knowledge, both from a local, regional and national perspective, but also from a technology policy and industry angle. So we really want to tap into this. And so in addition to answering your questions, the panel actually want to take the opportunity to put one specific question back to you. What will it take to get Orion off the ground and make the ideas a reality? And how should the project team go about this? So have a think about this question as you listen in for the next 30, 45 minutes or so. Put your answers on a postcard and then we're going to revisit this question at the end of the webinar. So with that introduction and scene setting done, I'm going to hand over to the first of our speakers, Douglas, to kick things off. Douglas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hannah Mary. Um, Good day, evening everyone. Uh, I am Douglas Irving and I work for Shetland Islands Council and the Future Energy team. And I will introduce the people and place aspects of the Orion Clean Energy Project. 
Shetland is a group of islands situated over 200 miles north of Aberdeen, roughly equidistant between Scotland and Norway, as the map shows. Our perception of the world is a feature of our location. At a crossroads in the North Atlantic with strong Nordic influences on our culture, economy and identity. Our population at the last census was around 23,000 pe people living mostly on our mainland and on another 13 islands. Being located at 60 degrees north means that our climate is very windy, wet and cool. As our situation suggests, we are a marine based society where a maritime culture influences all aspects of community life. We live by and with the sea. Our outlook is generally bright, modern and secular, taken from a long history of international trading, combined with a compelling need to be innovative and entrepreneurial to make the most of the resources provided in our lo remote location. Over the last 50 years, Shetland has been a prosperous place. We have been an international energy hub since 1978 and combined with a strong fishing and aquaculture industry and our other traditional industries, our annual economic output is very high. But all the activity associated with prosperity means that Shetland is very heavily hydrocarbon dependent. It is a great irony that despite being at the heart of the nation's oil and gas production for so many years, Shetland has to import all its fuel at significant additional cost. So enduring high energy costs combined with our colder and windier climate means we experience higher levels of fuel poverty. We don't have mains gas in Shetland, so typically it costs twice as much to heat a home in Shetland compared to mainland cities. In recent years, the oil and gas sector has been in decline in Shetland as oil and gas fields reach maturity and operators seek ways to be more competitive in the global market. There are fewer jobs in the sector and that contributes to people leaving the isles for better job prospects. As a consequence, Shetland's population is in decline and our demographic profile is aging faster than the Scottish average. Let's move on. Uh, the information on this next slide illustrates the busy nature of our economy. Around 700 people are still employed in the oil and gas industry, with over a thousand people directly and indirectly employed in the fishing and aquaculture sectors. Fishing is very important economically, with fish landings volumes being second in the UK. More fish is landed in Shetland annually than in the whole of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We farm about 20 to 25% of all Scottish salmon and 70 to 75% of all Scottish mussels. In recent years, the renewable energy sector has begun to be a prominent feature of our economy. Successful small scale wind projects have led to the development of the Viking wind farm, which is under construction and at 443 megawatts will be the largest onshore wind farm in the UK and an illustration of the wind power that is available in this northern location. And move on. A renewable energy is a massive opportunity for Shetland with access to wind, tide and sea energy sources. That combined with the existing oil and gas infrastructure and our existing energy skills base will help Shetland to meet the challenges of producing clean, secure and affordable energy for our own population, the transition to sustainable energy employment and reduce our carbon emissions to zero. Achieving green production in all our economic sectors will also stabilize economic prosperity in a world that will increasingly demand clean energy sourced produce. We also need to overcome our demographic challenge of an aging and declining population by encouraging more of our young people to live and work here and attracting in active people with the skills that these new energy opportunities require. All this forms the basis for the Orion Clean Energy Project, which is a part of the Council's climate change strategy and is a means to achieve energy transition in Shetland to below net zero while retaining an international energy hub in the islands 
supplying energy for national and international markets. Uh, my colleague Gunther Newcomb will now set out the details of the Orion Clean Energy Project. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, thanks for going through that. Um, what I'd like to do uh, is to give you a, an overview of the Orion project. And, and like every project, it, it really needs a vision. And I see on the slide there's, uh, there's five key elements to the Orion vig vision. Uh, Douglas already mentioned people, and people is at the heart of Orion. And, and what we have on Shetland is a skilled workforce both in the oil and gas sector and the marine sector that can transfer those skills into the renewables energy. Uh, that we're trying to promote for Orion. Uh, there's also deep water ports in Shetland. Uh, you see up there are tankers there. We've got Sullenvo, Dalevo, and three other ports. On the bottom right, uh, there's the industrial complex around uh, Sullenvo. So the intent is certainly utilize brownfield sites and repurpose oil and gas infrastructure uh, to develop the new renewables agenda. And, and driving all of this is uh, is onshore wind and also the development of offshore wind, which is critically important, and, and also tidal energy, which uh, which is also in Shetland, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. So this vision drives the three ambitions. The ambitions are, firstly, to use uh, initially onshore wind to help electrify offshore developments west of Shetland and then move with to offshore wind. The second one, as Douglas has mentioned already, is to transform the fossil fuel basis of the Shetland economy to a renewables one uh, for the benefit of, of everyone on, on the island and wider. Uh, and three, to, to utilize um, offshore wind primarily to create green hydrogen at industrial scale and then create a brand new uh, business on Shetland by exporting green hydrogen to the UK and, and to Europe. So that's the overall ambitions of the project. On the, on the framework of, of the five elements that you can see on the slide. Next slide, please. So just to describe a little bit more, the, the sort of three key parts here is the energy part on the left, what it produces in the middle and what it stops happening on the right. So as far as wind is concerned, uh, onshore, um, the Viking Wind Farm is the largest in the UK. There's other wind farms also there, and that is to start the development of the offshore electrification and also to supply energy to consumers on Shetland itself. Opportunities of using onshore wind to also to consecrate green hydrogen uh, on Shetland, so we're looking at that as well. Offshore, there's a huge resource, 10 gigawatts of energy easily uh, from wind to the east and west of, of the Shetland region. Uh, and also tidal energy has uh, already been in place since 2016, the first in the world, in fact, uh, for a tidal array. And, and recently, the very first uh, EV charging point uh, was put in Shetland, uh, the first again in the world for from tidal energy. So a huge resource base um, in Shetland with wind and tidal. Uh, apart from electricity, uh, can produce hydrogen. Shetland alone will need 60,000 tonnes of hydrogen to replace the current fossil fuels used for vehicles, boats and planes. So there's a local demand. Uh, if we can convert offshore a wind into hydrogen, can export 350,000 tonnes per annum, which is a huge volume. So it can be a very significant exporter for the UK. All of this is to, uh, to remove CO2 from our system. Um, as Douglas said, uh, Shetland uh, emissions are quite high per person. They're in fact, 25 tonnes per person per annum, which is potentially one of the highest in the world. Um, and we want to take that out by uh, having renewable energy. Also to electrify the whole of the offshore, we'll remove 8 million tonnes per annum, which is about half of the UK offshore oil and gas uh, emissions right now. So, so a very ambitious project here uh, on the back of uh, wind and tidal resource. Next slide, please. So quite quite a detailed frame here. This is the project timing. I just want to pick out a few things that I think are, are perhaps relevant for this evening. One is uh, what are the what are the enabling aspects of what's going on right now? So, so the onshore wind uh, from Viking Wind Farm is very important as a starting point for the renewables um, with regard to electrification of the offshore. Uh, tidal can also be upscaled, so that's also a part of the, the current initiative. And we're hoping by 2025 that offshore electrification will already start. And we will also hopefully have some green hydrogen production on Shetland. You'll see the box that's called green hydrogen. Um, SIC with HIE have been working very hard to get funding from the UK and Scottish government. 
and have been provisionally assigned £5 million to establish four green hydrogen pilot plants on Shetland, which will be operational by 2025. So between onshore wind, tidal energy, and these pilots, that will be the start of the process of the, of the renewable agenda on Shetland. Offshore wind licensing round is currently happening. Uh, the Scott Wind Round has a block to the east, it's called NE1. Uh, there's up to two gigawatts of, of wind resource there. And if that can also be um, utilized pre-2030, that will also then upscale the green hydrogen to, to industrial levels. So what we need here is help from the government in funding. Uh, we need help from investors uh, and industry. We're seeing a lot of that right now, so that's fantastic news. And we intend to initiate a techno techno-economic study on Orion and the northeast of Scotland, which has been funded in part by industry at the beginning of June of this year. So hopefully that gives you a, an overview of the Orion project. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Emma, who will take you through the OGTC technology aspects. Thanks, Gunther. I'm just going to give a bit of a background to OGTC and then go into its role in the Orion project. So the OGTC was established in 2017 as part of the Aberdeen City Region deal. To date, it has invested over 163 million with industry, completed over 265 projects, has 100 field trials either completed or planned, and over 20 technologies commercialised. OGTC's mission is to develop and deploy technology for an affordable net zero North Sea. So as part of the Orion project, OGTC sees huge benefits of such a project and that the project can bring to the North Sea. For this project, a lot of technology and innovation will be required. Next slide, please. So through other reports that have been published, including the Closing the Gap report and the Integrated Energy Vision report, we know there's a lot of technology gaps in the energy transition that will need to be closed in order, in order for us to meet our net zero targets. Um, now, for the Orion project, we don't know the exact technology that we're going to need. We're, as Gunther mentioned, we're undergoing a techno-economic study, which will help us answer that very important question. However, we do know that we will need some form of technology innovation in the offshore wind space. So the technology is quite advanced for offshore wind. However, for Orion, it's looking like we, floating winds could be the option due to very deep waters floating wind has a bit more stability um, we're looking at substructures for floating offshore wind mooring designs and to reduce the cost of dynamic cabling all of these could be part of the orion project moving on to hydrogen now whether this is blue or green hydrogen there's technology advancements to be made if it's blue hydrogen, alternative technology we can look at. We can also look at increasing the efficiency of current SMR or ATR technology. For green hydrogen, saltwater electrolysis can be looked at. So electrolysis needs very pure water. So we can look at saltwater electrolysis to reduce the desalination required. We can also look at subsea electrolyzer systems with compression integrated electrolyzers with offshore wind, and also look at export potential. So pipelines, what pipelines can be reused if we need new pipelines, uh, the type of pipelines and the routes for these. We can also look at the medium, so whether it's being transported as hydrogen or we transport hydrogen as ammonia and then convert it back. As part of this, OGTC are also currently undertaking a project looking at LOHC, so liquid organic hydrogen carriers. This could be part of the Orion project as well as a potential export option for the hydrogen. And this brings me on to my final slide about collaboration. So the Orion partnership uh, is Shetland Island Council the OGTC, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. The Orion project can also pull on BP, Shell, Equinor, Total, SSE, Enquest, Hitachi ABB, and Sicker Point Energy for a lot of its guidance and collaboration for the project. 
The OGTC also pulls on numerous in industries and partnerships, and this is all important for such a project as Orion. As we've seen, we've held over 30 supply chain workshops, and as part of these workshops, they've been a valuable insight around the supply chain, what work is currently going on, the challenges each of these supply chains are facing, the strengths that each of these could bring to help Orion. Um, and this has proven that collaboration is key and working together is what's going to help the Orion project move forward. I will now pass back to Gunther. Thank you, Emma. So you can see on the screen the companies that are all involved um, in the Orion project. So it's uh, there's lots of moving parts uh, and it's um, it's a quite an integrated project and has been worked totally virtually since uh, we started in April of last year. So not many projects have done that. So how would I describe Orion? I mean, in a, in a number of words, I'd say incredibly ambitious, uh, a very exciting project to work in, truly transformational uh, at both the local and at an industrial scale. It is it is unique in some ways, but there's many areas that are replicable as well. It's incredibly important for people, not just people on, on Shetland, but people in the northeast of Scotland and, met, and the supply chain, incredibly important for them. Uh, and I think it is also really doable. And for it to be doable, uh, we need help. We need some support in funding. We're getting some of that, which is great. Uh, we need investors to come in and can see the ambition and can see the opportunity and invest in this project. So as, uh, as uh, Hannah Mary said, be very interested in your views about Orion, your questions, and, and basically how, how we can succeed. We're trying our very best. We're making great progress, uh, but um, any thoughts that you have of how we can make that even better would be incredibly welcome. So, so thank you very much for listening from all three of us. Thank you, Gunter. And I think it's a, a great slide to end on with that sort of call to action in terms of the words that you used on ambitious, exciting, transformational. And in this next 20, 25 minutes, that's what we want to dig down into to really understand how this is going to become a reality. So this, this marks the sort of start of our, our Q&A uh, chat towards the panel. Um, I've got a few questions here that I'm going to put to, to yourselves. But I also encourage uh, people on the call, if they have a question, to put up their hand as the chat function uh, isn't working. So if I can have all the panellists turn on their, their camera, that would be fantastic. But Gunter, I want to come to you first with a question. Um, some might say that there are you know, plenty of accessible locations across the UK with, with access to deep markets and integrated supply chains and, and lots of credible infrastructure. So why why Shetland? So as I said, it's a, it's unique in a way. It has this unique selling points, uh, but it also has the ability for rep replicability for others. And I think if I just pick on one area, for instance, uh, green hydrogen at industrial scale. So what what do you have on Shetland? You have you have the wind resource from the offshore, which would be the primary driver for that. Uh, you have a fantastic port facilities with experienced and skilled people who know how to operate uh, boats. OK, and you've got um, then potential export routes. Emma already mentioned liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Uh, that's one way of exporting it. We also want to look at uh, the potential to create uh, marine fuels, synthetic marine fuels, looking at methanol, ammonia, many other types of fuel so that we can use uh, it for bunkering and also export from Shetland. Uh, and also, um, Shetland has a pipeline infrastructure. There's uh, export lines going off Shetland into St. Fergus, again, and the ability to blend. So we, we have a lot of the components that you can really create an export commodity of green hydrogen or its derivatives at scale. Uh, we also have an interconnector that will be established, so electricity can flow from Shetland to the mainland and vice versa. So that's another thing that we have. So we will be connected to the grid. But I think everything that we're doing is also the things we're learning, other areas of the UK and Scotland in particular can benefit from as well. And we're very much, as Emma said, into collaboration. We're working with the Port of Cromarty. We're working with Pale Blue Dot. Uh, we're talking all the time with the Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise and HIE to make sure that we really establish a great collaborative platform 
So it's not it's not just all about Orion. It's about what about, what about the rest of Scotland? What about Northeast Scotland as well? So so that's what we're trying to do, um, Hannah Marie. Yeah. I hear that, and certainly that image that uh, that was created by Vore Energy, which uh, which uh, Douglas shared at the start of Shetland being in the centre uh, of the sort of northern uh, Atlantic at 60 degrees north, that really indicates and displays what you're talking about, Gunter, the mm -hmm. strategic location of Shetland. So you've mentioned some of the, the infrastructure and uh, some of the other export options for, for uh, hydrogen. But Emma, you know, this infrastructure comes from oil and gas, uh, and a lot of the skill sets that we see come from oil and gas. You mentioned that there are some technology gaps, and how do you see the oil and gas uh, competence and technology being reused within Orion uh, and, and, and some of the innovations and, and deep uh, resources that have been from oil and gas. How do you see them playing a part in the future uh, of new energy with the Orion project? I see them playing quite a big part of the future of the Orion project and other energy transition projects. So as Gunther mentioned, a lot of infrastructure can be reused for the energy transition. Also, a lot of the skills built up in the oil and gas industry will be transferable into the energy transition. And we mustn't forget that when we're looking at, obviously new skills will also be required, but there is a lot that we can bring over and a lot that people have that will be needed in the energy transition. Thank you. So picking up on that point on this idea of transition, and, you know, transition this, at least for the last 12, 18 months, this uh, this buzzword, and it's a very good phrase of a just transition has been forefront at folks minds. And that just transition, uh, Douglas, you mentioned it as well, and it, it takes in the element of people, but also planets uh, and ensuring that we have a good transition for, for the workers of, of oil and gas currently. So, Douglas, um, you know, what do you think Orion's role is in a just transition and, and how specifically would the project go about achieving this for, for Shetland and the people that are employed within uh, the industries currently on the islands? Thank you. Uh, just transition applies uh, to Shetland, also applies more generally to the, to the, to the whole, whole sector because uh, the, a, a just transition has to apply across the whole and gas whole of the oil and gas sector but in Shetland at the moment we have around about 700 people uh, directly and indirectly employed in, in oil and gas as and as I said in the in in my part of the presentation there is the, the beginnings of a, of a, a clean energy industry in, in Shetland and over time uh, what, what, what we will see is that side of the the, the clean energy side uh, expanding as, as the oil and gas sector declines. So what's important is that we, we retain um, jobs associated with clean energy in, in the islands uh, as we go forward. And that may mean that we have to encourage and, and new skills into the islands, but what we must do is ensure that the, the people working in the oil and gas industries are, are able to reskill and upskill uh, to, to, to work in the new sectors. And, and, and because a lot of this is to do with engineering, um, uh, the, the, that that should be entirely possible. Um, so, so that's uh, that that would be the basis of this. So we, we're looking. Uh, our ambition is to have around about 500 jobs uh, in uh, clean energy by 2030, and then see that expanding up to uh, 1,500 to 1,700 by, by the end of the following decade. And that, uh, and, and during that time, the, oil, the the employment in oil and gas will decline uh, as as the the new energies, the new clean energies kick in. Oh, thanks, Douglas. I can see a couple of hands up on the screen now, um, and I I want to kind of open this sort of piece on just transition and local content and, and jobs up to the audience. So if anyone has a, a question on that or anything other, please stick up your hand. Jonathan, I can see that your hand's up. And you're on mute, Jonathan. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I think it's fascinating. You're doing a wonderful job there. I think it's a fantastic project, so I really hope it succeeds. Um, 
So, um, yeah, my question was actually really basic, which is I didn't quite know how to do the chat function on my team. So that's <laughs> really a bit of a, a basic question, but um, I don't know if other people have the same issue. Um, uh, just to say, I said it in the introduction, the chat function isn't working tonight. So if ah, you do have right, a question. Okay. I, missed it. I missed the beginning of the meeting, so yeah. sorry about that. Um, yeah, so whether I can say otherwise, um, have I got anything else I wanted to ask uh, particularly? Um, um, I, I can say I think it's a great project. I, I obviously interested to learn more, see how I can sort of help support you guys to, to, to make it uh, come to pass. Um, I mean, I work mainly in, in the south in, in England and in Scotland. So um, uh, although I originated in, in my business originated in Shetland in the 90s and I helped with the demand side management program that you did um, back then with the district heating scheme and so on. So uh, so that's how far back I go. Uh, um, um, Irvin and so on. So, um, yeah, if I can help you in any way, then obviously I will, and we'll keep in touch on that basis. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I, I, um, I haven't got anything specific except possibly. I don't know if I'm. I might not be the. I might be the only one, but it'd be quite good just to explain the difference in blue and green hydrogen. I think I know what it is, but I just thought I didn't know if you actually explained that to the audience. Um, okay, thanks, Jonathan. Maybe Emma, you could quickly explain the difference between the two. Yeah, so blue hydrogen uses um, gas and it takes the CO2 out, out of it and so that the CO2 is then either stored underground or used to something else and it produces hydrogen from processes such as steam methane reforming or automatic ATR. Um, green hydrogen is produced from water, so it produces hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen can then be used for th things such as fish farming, which is part of the Orion project is looking at that as well. And so green hydrogen doesn't have any emissions from it, so it is a lot cleaner. Um, yes. And it uses water, but it at the moment, current technology uses very pure treated water. Um, so that's why I mentioned before technology we're looking at to see if we can use salt water. Great. Thanks, Emma. Brilliant. Good. It's um, perhaps worth adding about blue hydrogen. You may have seen on the slides that blue hydrogen is one of the opportunities. Uh, as Emma said, you need natural gas as one of the commodities. And there's only two places in Scotland that currently have natural gas landing on the beach. One is in Shetland, because uh, there's two gas import lines there. And one is at St. Fergus, where those actual lines end up with other lines hitting the Scottish uh, mainland. So you need natural gas. And, and as you say, you need to do something with the CO2 and you need to store it. Uh, and that is also a possibility offshore on the East Shetland Basin. Uh, feels like Magnus can store CO2. There are pipelines that are currently available that could export it. There's a gas plant that exists that could be repurposed. Yeah, And we have also export lines where you can blend gas with uh, with natural gas with hydrogen to export to the mainland. So what we don't know yet is whether that will work commercially and technically, but that is one of the studies that we are going to undertake is to evaluate the potential for creating blue hydrogen on Shetland. We don't know yet if it will work, but we're going to be reviewing it. Very good. Thanks both for your answer. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's also there's also different types, just for your information, Jonathan, there's pink and, and grey hydrogen as well. So I suggest you look into that. It's, it's all, there's a whole rainbow. Um, I can also see that uh, Colin Black, you have your hand up uh, if we go to you. Uh, thank you for a, a really informative and uh, collaborative uh, presentation. It's great when we discussed this, Gunther, it, uh, we, we talked about how we'd come together and it was great to see it tonight. Um, I'm just off a, a previous um, webinar and we were discussing the, the Shetland Space Centre. So when I saw the, the map today and saw that Shetland was the centre of the world, um, I just wondered how that would link together the Space Centre, Orion project and a, a holistic view of Shetland as far as skills. And going forward, I'll 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 open on that one uh, if I may. Yeah, so the the, the space center project is uh, uh, along with the the this uh, idea to try to try and get green hydrogen started. That's part of the, that's one. It's uh, those are two of the projects and the uh, and the islands deal which we the heads of terms have now been signed. So we have been speaking to the space center about what they're. 
um, f your fuel requirements are, are, are likely to be. And there is um, quite a strong connection as far as the, the skills base uh, goes and, and trying to make sure that we we um, can do uh, as, as much of the training uh, 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 locally as, uh, as we can. So that that the there there are clear synergies and we we are looking to see if we can we can hook both projects up uh, closer as we go forward and in fact the the, the island deals um the nature of the island deal and ensures that we must try and keep uh, keep our projects as as uh, joined up as we can uh, just just to add colin i mean emma mentioned before that is when you you're producing green hydrogen you have oxygen as well being produced uh, and she mentioned uh, use in fish farming is for hatcheries, and, uh, and that's already done in Norway. In fact, they do use green hydrogen um, in Norway and, and use the oxygen for, for hatcheries. So that's one of the ideas for Shetland, but also for the Space Centre, because they will also need oxygen. So on top, on top of power. So there is, I think this is a very, you know, it's a very circular uh, sort of uh, uh, project that we're looking at. There's, there's connections everywhere. So we're trying to ensure that we talk to all stakeholders. I think that's really important thing about Orion. Um, the supply chain in particular of St. Us is really great that you're talking about a project right in this early stages, not when it's already been done and it's too late for us to get involved. You're doing it now. You're, you're getting us involved right now. So I think that that's, that's important too, Colin, is to get that supply chain involved right in the beginning of the project. And we have um, literally dozens and dozens of conversations every month with supply chain companies. Uh, and they have a lot to offer for for Orion and for themselves from Orion. Yes, and it's excellent to have OGTC at the cutting edge of that as well, so that mm. it's joined up all the way through. So, excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you, Colin, and thanks for your answers, uh, Douglas and Gunter. It's, it's great to see this cross-sector holistic view that Orion has taken. Um, okay, I can see Richard has his hand up, and then we'll go back to some other of, of my questions. Richard, please. Hi, hello everybody. I suppose the point I'd like to make is I've listened and, and I've heard you saying about the skills of your people. I would also like to emphasize the relationship skills that people in, in Shetland and Orkney have. They've got fantastic relationship skills. They get on well with everybody. They're very easy to work with. I, I've got a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time working with people in Orkney and it's a very pleasant experience to work with people that work in Orkney and have things to share from Orkney as well as Shetland. The other point I would make is you mentioned that you're upskilling your own people in Shetland. You know, there's a great opportunity not only to upskill your own people in Shetland, but to share that expertise and upskilling your own people with the rest of the United Kingdom, Scotland or England, and help upskill the whole of the UK, not just yourselves, because you can be at the cutting edge of all of this and you can help the whole of the UK advance and move forward with energy management. That's just the points I would like to make. Thank you, Richard. Okay, I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask some more questions, and then we'll come back to some audience questions again. Um, so, so Douglas, you had mentioned this uh, this heritage and link with the sea with Shetland, uh, and we've talked a bit and we've touched upon it just now in the in the chat with some of the audience members about Orion's project role uh, in sort of a Shetland facilitation to net zero, so aquaculture, shipping, and fishing. I wonder if you can expand a bit more on that, on how Orion could help other industries in Shetland uh, on that journey to net zero. Yeah, very happy to do that. Uh, yeah, uh, the transition um, from hydrocarbons to, to uh, clean energy uh, on the marine side is, is, is one of the um, more, more difficult areas that we, we must get involved in because, uh, uh, as, as I explained uh, earlier, um, we are dependent on our, our marine economy, so we have we have begun to um, look into this uh, area of activity. I, mean, I I call it the Shetland Green Marine Project, but it's, it's just my own uh, uh, name at the moment. So there is a there is uh, uh, we will be hosting workshops in the in the next while to see if we can we can get movement at a local beginning at a local level, but we. We have um, we have partners involved in our project who can really help us uh, um, move in that area, and we are speaking to some of the the larger supply chain companies who who can get involved in that that too. So it is an important part of of our uh, uh, of our, our route to, to net zero, 
to try and um, uh, uh, make the cha make changes in the well, aquaculture, the fishing industry, and and all um, Ch Shetland marine based, and 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 try to make sure that our port our ports can be, our port facilities can be uh, as as green as they can. So, uh, we're um, I'm I'm very pleased with the with the route that we're taking in, into that. So we're, but it is we're right at the start, but uh, we're, I think we're taking the right steps. But I'm I'm sure Gunther has a has more to say on that. Yes, thanks, Douglas. So we work as a tag team. You may realise Emma, Douglas, and I all work together on Orion, so we 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 know how we each think. Um, I, I think what's um, what's really interesting about the Shetland Marine picture is that it's so diverse, uh, and and it ranges everything from you know oil tankers to service vessels that support the oil and gas industry, uh, a massive fishing fleet. You've got inter-island ferries. You've got ferries to the mainland. You've got decommissioning on, on the island. Um, you've got aquaculture. You've got the whole flotilla, if you like, of, of marine activities. So so creating a marine strategy for Orion is something we're really trying to work on right now. It's at the front end, but we're really thankful we have Strathclyde University that we brought in. Strathclyde are now a strategic partner to Orion. They bring a massive knowledge base in the area of marine activities. They have a phenomenal marine department. Uh, we're also working with Arup and Ricardo. Uh, with with Strathclyde as well to help develop the means marine strategy uh, and also uh, as as Douglas said we are going to engage very soon within about a month or so with literally dozens of local supply chain companies who are all involved in in marine activities so that we can really work together and look at what what is what needs to be done when and by whom you know we can't do everything uh, it needs to be staged it needs to be prioritized uh, and that's what we want to do. But I think, you know, from the learning from Shetland, uh, I think uh, are very applicable in other parts of the UK. So, we, as I said, we have a huge diverse activity set, uh, which can be then shared with others. And and, uh, and we also want to work with the, uh, the UK government. We will be applying uh, for funding from the Clean Maritime um, uh, Demonstration Fund. It's a £20 million fund uh, to help us uh, understand the the marine uh, aspects of Orion, and we will be applying for a grant from from that particular fund, which is a UK fund. So, uh, very important area is, uh, is marine uh, transition, uh, and it's a global thing. It's not just a Shetland thing. So, I think we can learn from from other areas, and they can also learn from us. Absolutely, I think if Shetland can can get this right, I mean, what an export story that is in terms of trying to integrate different sectors together. Um, and facilitate net zero transition. If I can ask folk that are uh, not speaking or asking a question just to put their cameras off, so it's just the panel on screen, I think that would uh, make the visuals a bit a bit easier. Um, I want to turn uh, to, to ask a, a question on fuel poverty. And you, you mentioned fuel poverty, uh, I think it was Douglas actually, in, in uh, your, your overview. So, one in three households in the Isles are in fuel poverty. It's a very real thing for, for Shetland, as you mentioned. And so we now have new energy arriving in Shetland and, and really Shetland should be gearing up and setting itself up to maximise the benefits from this. And I'm, I'm speaking about quite radical uh, new ways of thinking. So for example, uh, establishing an energy trust that could act as a local uh, electricity retailer or perhaps a financial vehicle to ensure equity stake in, in further future projects that are coming to the island. What's your view on this? Uh, I'll come to you first, Douglas, on how forward leaning Shetland should be in this and how demanding Shetland should be towards uh, this new energy coming in. Yeah, that is what, one of the one of the reasons, Hannah Mary, that the council um, uh, uh, embarked on, on the, the um, Orion project and set up the future energy team uh, is to try and uh, um, th think seriously about how we can try and overcome the, the fuel poverty situation. Well, we've ex as we explained the area earlier, we we will have green electricity available uh, to us by 2025, and there's work being done to see how we can uh, try to make sure that that's um, uh, that supply of, of electricity is. Um, 
as affordable as it can be. So there's this we are beginning to, to look at that. that. I would also speak about, I'll go back to the Islands deal again, where we're working in uh, collaboration with Orkney and the Western Islands and what's called the Island Centre for Net Zero, where we will be um, t together, the three islands will be working to, to, to because th this fuel poverty is a, is a challenge in, in all three <laughs> island groups. So we're, we're, we're working together to try and find the best solutions um, for uh, electricity and for for uh, other other fuels uh, as, as 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 we go forward so uh, and we are we have one of our, again Gunther spoke about Strathclyde University but Strathclyde University uh, are um, leading on a project which, where we will be looking at the the future of um, electricity supply in Shetland post post Viking so that's one project we're we're looking at but but also working together with the with the other two islands to, to understand all the technology that we can apply and and our colleagues in Orkney have made um, some important strides to, to, towards that um, aim al already so what we will be learning a bit from Orkney as we go along yeah uh, uh, I just yeah yeah just mentioned um, in his um, introduction that Shetland has been at the heart of the oil and gas industry um, for, for de literally decades. But that product has, in fact, gone off the beach in Shetland in tankers and pipelines elsewhere. And they've paid a premium for their fuel. And they've also paid some of the highest uh, grid charges as well in, in Scotland. But in Orion, Orion is trying to just change that whole dynamic. As, as Douglas just said, you know, the SIC are very much involved in this project. They've They've put money in, they've established a new futures team, they've just got three new recruits that are literally joining this month in that team. Uh, and I think it'd be the worst possible outcome if Shetland has to import clean energy uh, for, for Shetlanders and for businesses on Shetland. It, it'd be just totally the wrong thing. So if you don't have a right and you don't do what we're trying to do right now, that's what will happen. They will be importing hydrogen or, or methanol or whatever from the mainland. And that would be totally wrong, given the skills on the island, given the renewable energy that's there through onshore and offshore wind and tidal. It has all of the components to, to create its own uh, clean energy and do it at such a scale to create a brand new business, to, to keep people employed and uh, to, to develop the skills for an export business as well. So I think it's absolutely critical that we get this right uh, and, and, and work it in the right way. So I think it's an incredibly important um, strategic project for the island itself. I, I agree, and I think that it, it requires for for that uh, you know that that real Shetland benefit to come. It requires our local trusts and also our local government to really take a strong stance and to to sort of put their money where their mouth is uh, in terms of to really ask for the big asks from the big uh, companies that are coming in. Um, I can see some more hands up. Does, does anyone else have questions that they would like to put to the panel? Now is really the time to, to ask them and, and get your hand up and put your questions forward. I can see that uh, Dexter Crow, you have a question and your hand up. Yes. Hi, can, can you hear me? Uh... Yep, we can. Yes. Um, so, first of all, thank you for a very powerful presentation. I, I can see you tick a lot of the boxes uh, in, in terms of, of, of why um, green hydrogen could be produced in, in the Shetlands. And, uh, you know, I, I also would like to say I, I think this is a very nice format where the, the presentation and the, the interaction with the audience is, is given equal time. So in, in the spirit of, of trying to help the project, I, I've spent a career in the oil and gas industry and my mindset for green hydrogen was always that you, uh, you inject the CO2 back in, in an old, uh, uh, let's say depleted gas field or oil field uh, with, with the aged infrastructure, but you really need to break that mindset and find a place to inject in shallow aquifers that that capture that CO2 the same way that the Humber and Teesside projects 
have identified the endurance uh, offshore location that that shallow aquifer to, to be the, the the CO2 sink. So is is there you, you mentioned in in your talk that Magnus might be the place to dispose the CO2, but I presume then you have to keep alive all of that infrastructure. Is is there any shallow aquifer sink that you found for the CO2? I try and um, and answer that. So I suppose the first thing, uh, Dexter. Thanks for the question. Um, it, uh, the primary focus is on producing green hydrogen, where CO2 isn't the byproduct. But we're also looking at blue hydrogen plant on Shetland. So the only CO2 that we would look at storing and capturing from a hydrogen plant on Shetland would be from a blue hydrogen plant. And and for that, it's about twenty thousand tons per annum we've calculated, uh, and that could potentially go into Magnus. In fact. I'm a geologist by background. Um, CO2 flood could really work in Magnus to enhance oil production, in fact, uh, let alone for disposal. And there, there's plenty of work being done by the British Geological Society with the OJ to look at aquifers in the northern uh, East Shetland Basin as well. So you're quite right, there are other horizons that could be looked at. Uh, I think what's important about this project is what we're trying to do is to, is to stop the CO2 being produced in the first place. So by electrifying the offshore, by going away from gas or diesel turbines on production facilities in West and East of Shetland, by using uh, electrification of those facilities on the back of onshore stroke offshore wind, they won't produce the CO2 in the first place. So what we're trying to do is to stop the CO2 being produced by electrifying offshore facilities and also do the same onshore. We're talking about electrifying the Salambo terminal. How do you electrify the port of Salambo? How do you have your tankers to plug and charge from electricity that is provided from the grid from a renewable source and not have their engines switched on the whole time they're in port? So I think our main emphasis of CO2 is not to have it produced in the first place. But there is another option in Orion that we could be the centre for CO2 storage and then further distribution, a bit like the Northern Lights project that Hannah Mary's company is involved in, where it gathers the CO2 in one place and then takes it somewhere else. Shetland could be a place where you transport your CO2 to the island, you store it, you aggregate it, and you ship it somewhere else. So that's also something we're thinking of as a part of Orion. So there's lots of moving parts here. Hopefully I've tried yeah. to explain it as best I can. Absolutely, Gunther. And the possibilities seem to be sort of unending, which is really good to see that innovation spirit come through. I want to rattle through a few more of these questions as I know we're getting towards six o'clock. Alice, I see your hand is up. Hello, thank you for a really interesting presentation. I've got two quick questions. Um, the first one is on the Northlink ferries. I'm just wondering, um, it, I, I could quickly Google it, but I did and I didn't get a answer I wanted. I'm just wondering if, if they utilize any biofuels just yet. And secondly, um, <laughs> I've been to, I'm a geologist myself also, and um, obviously Shetland is very interesting, especially Ernst for, um, for geologists, especially peridotite on the surface, which is a natural hydrogen emitter. I, I don't know if it's economic, but there's a lot of native sources of hydrogen. I'm just wondering if any of that has been considered. It's a bit left field, but uh, just drop it in there. Thanks, Alice. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, thank you, Alice. Um, but I'll answer the question on the biofuels. There's, there's no use of biofuels on the, on, on the northern um, uh, ferries at the moment. Uh, uh, the Scot these routes are, uh, are sponsored by the Scottish government, and as you're probably well aware, the Scottish government are looking at um, the best ways to, to, to uh, for, for the for the whole ferry fleet in Scotland to be, to be. Um, to transition to, to to cleaner forms, so that's that work is being done. At, uh, is be, beginning at the moment. As far as far as the geology goes, I'll I'll defer to my uh, geology fr friend to to answer you that uh, answer that one. So it'll be a, quite a quick answer on, on the prototype. Is no, <laughs> we've not looked at that um, as a source of hydrogen. Um, but it's an interesting thought, Alice. So, so thanks for that. Uh, I wasn't even aware of it. So, um, so that that's great. And I think going back to the Northlink bit, uh, who are operated by Circo, 
we certainly, when we want to talk a marine strategy, we want to get Circo involved in that as well. So there's a certainly intent there to 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 have a look at um, how do you green the ferries, not not just the North Link one, but into island ones, yeah. etc. So yes. so so absolutely, we want to be engaged with with uh, with Circo on that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Alice. And and nice to see another geologist. I'm a geologist by background as well, so you're in good company. <laughs> Sorry, Douglas, on you go. I was just going to say that one of our new recruits is a geologist as well. So. We get around, that's for sure. Uh, I see some more hands up. Uh, Robert Barnes, your hand is up. Hello, and thank you very much, all the panel, for a very interesting discussion. I visited the Shetland uh, Islands in 2015, and we're coming back in a month's time for a week's holiday. So I look forward very much to coming again. I've worked in, in the oil and gas industry on and off for many years, and I remember the transition from LNG, uh, from uh, coal gas to LNG back in the beginning of the 70s. Um, my question was simply that um, regarding Alice's comment on uh, biofuels and the ferries in Northlink. Um, I did the energy assessment uh, ESOS for Whitelink ferries down between Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight um, two years ago, and they had introduced the the new hybrid ferry Victoria of White. And our assessment, and the, there's no secret about this, is it looked as though it had reduced um, fuel consumption by about 16% in the first. 18 uh, first uh, eight or nine months so i pass that on um i know it's not biofuels but it's a very good diesel electric plant a diesel battery electric hybrid ferry um the other thing i was going to suggest is or ask rather is are you connected in with what is going on with the northern power group um in newcastle sped adam uh, and the health and safety uh, executive who have a laboratory for testing the safety of hydrogen in Buxton. I could answer that in part. Um, certainly, I'm, we're very aware of the hydrogen testing facility in Buxton. We we are, Robert, uh, members of many trade associations uh, and try and use them to, to connect what we're trying to do. Uh, for instance, um, we're part of Nexus. We're part of... Uh, Hi, uh, we are a part of uh, uh, Scottish Hydrogen uh, Foundation. We are part of um, North Sea High, High Map, uh, Wind Europe. Um, we are lots and lots of organisations. So we, we we try and learn uh, from others. So you know you 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 are comment about the the ferry then and having reduced fuel consumption is is really important. We we're not at that level of detail yet. I would say. We want to bring that. That's something I hope for the ferries will definitely bring in once we start working on marine strategy. It's not just about converting everything straight away. It's about how can you best utilize what you have already? How do you capture emissions? There's a whole bunch of things that we'll need to look at in addition to totally changing the uh, the energy source. So we're trying through uh, our association with many different organizations to ensure that we get the learnings from others into this project. But we're still at a pretty early stage. We haven't got quite as specific as what you just mentioned, but it's, it's great to know. So thank you very much. So I'm keeping an eye on the time here, um, and I, I want to move into this final section where we we started to sort of get into it already, but we posed the question right at the beginning. You know, what will it take to get Orion off the ground and make these ideas a reality? And how should the project team go about doing that? So I want to hear from the audience uh, your suggested answers to that question. You know, how does this project really get off the ground and what does it take? Uh, and how would the project go about doing that? So I can see some hands up. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Thomas first. And if, Thomas, if you can say, say who you are and where you come from and, and your background as well very briefly, as well as your answer. Hi there, good afternoon. Um, obviously, my name is Thomas. Um, I'm based in Aberdeen and I'm an engineer. Um, basically, what I think is sort of necessary for the the, the successful execution of this sort of project and, and concept is 
collaborations with sub having supply chain and as as you are doing um directly having that conversation with who's going to be building the the networks the substructure as you talked about for electrification um i notice uh, over in norway there's highwind tampen which is being built in the fjords over there but similarly if something was to to develop on, on this side then certainly that has to come into the equation as well i would imagine so yeah that the collaboration is the big one for me thank you thomas and thank colin you. i see your your hand is up as well hello thank you yeah i'm, I'm based in shetland i'm sort of retired based in shetland and I'm really confident that uh, Shetland can cope and lead the way with this exciting project. I think what's going to be crucial is the support you get from the Scottish government and the UK government to make sure that it's feasible and, and you know, that they can put pressure on trying to phase out fossil fuels. So that's all going to be about timing. So I think that that really, is, to me, is a crucial part, the support you get from the Scottish government and the UK government. Thank you, Colin. And I can see Richard Cooper, your hand is also up. Hi there, I think I'm probably the only person that's not got their camera ready, but um, uh, yeah, I'm Richard, I'm based down in Glasgow. And I guess my thought was, this is um, a really interesting project that I think my employer might be interested in collaborating or joining the collaboration on. Um, are there any, uh, th that last slide had a contact detail on it that uh, looked like it'd probably be useful to get again. But is there any content um, that is shareable that I could uh, give my employer to help, um, I don't know, promote your idea and maybe get them to get in touch? Good, maybe you want to answer that one. Yeah, I, I presume are you providing these slides um, on your website or anything after this, Anna Marie? Um, is that intent yeah. here? Yeah, and, yeah, and um, if you're interested, that's my email at the bottom, nukesga at gmail.com. Um, as project coordinator, obviously anything that comes into me, I share with the team and wider. So if you want to use that email, that's perfectly fine. And, and the presentation will be on the Energy Institute website. Uh, we're in the process of uh, starting up our own Orion website, which will have a soft start sometime in June, uh, but it'll be about 3Q before it's uh, up and running. And that's being currently created as a part of our communication strategy. And once that's up, uh, that will have loads of information on it. But uh, that's, a, that's a couple of months away right now. So please contact me by email um, and have a look at the uh, slides on the website. Excellent. Thank you. So I don't see any other hands up. I want to just give a sort of couple of seconds more before I close this session to see if anyone else has that sort of golden answer for the project on, on how they really make this into reality. But if not, then I will I will start to close this just now, uh, as I know this is getting into to evening. Uh, I want to say that this is this has been a really engaging session with a lot of good discussion and some thought provoking uh, 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 discussion points as well. And it's it's really clear that Orion is a project with huge potential for Shetland, but also as as members of the audience have said and and the panels itself in playing a part in Scotland's map to net zero, but also the energy industry here in the UK. So I want to say thank you uh, to to Gunter. Uh, to Douglas and to Emma for giving such thoughtful measured answers and also providing insight and knowledge on the topics. It's been great to have you all and thank you for your time. And then lastly, thank you uh, to all of you and the audience for giving up your evening to join us and I hope you found it useful. And if you're interested in hearing more about the Energy Institute, uh, who we are uh, and what we do and, and how to get in more involved in some of the projects and the events and the training that we actually run, then please stay on the call um, for another five minutes. And Katrina, our event coordinator, and her team are going to run through some more information and advice on membership. So with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, and thanks once again for a great evening. Uh, and have a, a good rest of your Thursday.
thank you for the opportunity to, to present. Thank you yep. very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Hannah Mary and our panel, um, and thanks for you all, as Hannah Mary said, for joining us. Uh, yeah, so there is an opportunity, if you are a member or a non-member, to stick with us for a few more minutes, um, and we can chat through what the EI is all about and what we can do for you. Somebody got the audio. Welcome, Terry. Hello. Hey. Terry is our uh, membership development manager. I think I've got that right, Terry. And yeah, that's right. Yvonne is with us as our m and &E advisor, our membership and education advisor from the branch. Uh, Yvonne is with us. Uh, Angela, she say, is with us as well, but not on camera. Um, so we've got a few people still with us. Uh, so Terry, if I could throw something out at you straight away. Um, because we had quite a lot of people. I think we had nearly 80 on the call today. So uh, tell us, uh, what are the key benefits of becoming a member of the EI? And uh, yeah, I'm presuming we'll have a mix of members and non-members on the call. So uh, let us know what the EI can do for everyone. Um, not to the short, short answer, um, but no, there, there really are. There really is a wide range of, of benefits and services available to, to our members. Um, just to highlight a few, um, it can enable you to stay in the know, um, whether that's through one of our monthly magazines, um, Energy World or Petroleum Review, or through our monthly e-newsletter, um, Energy Network, which um, keeps you up to date with everything that's going on in the energy sector. And similarly, uh, membership can put knowledge um, at your fingertips. Um, we have a knowledge site, um, a separate knowledge website, where we've got um, you know, tens of thousands of, of um, energy related resources available. Um, and equally, we have a publication site where we store lots of uh, technical publications, good practice guidance uh, and industry standards. Now, as a member, um, you are actually entitled to a discounted rate on those technical publications, um, but you also get, uh, get discounts on our events um, and our training courses, um, of which there are many different options. Um, you can also put a stamp on your uh, energy credentials. Um, so with our support, we can help you work towards professional membership um, and professional registration. So charter titles, for example. Um, and that means you can gain formal recognition of your competence and your uh, expertise in energy. And we actually have three exclusive chartered titles that you can't get anywhere else. Um, and they are Chartered Energy Manager, Chartered Energy Engineer and Chartered Petroleum Engineer. A relatively new benefit um, is EI Connect. Um, that's our new mentoring platform. Um, it's open to mentors and mentees is exclusively for associate members and professional members of the EI. Um, so if you sign up, there's an opportunity there to share your knowledge and help others progress or develop yourself and, and achieve one of, the, one of your own goals. And there are also lots of opportunities to um, have your say, to contribute um, and to connect with others that work in energy, whether that's through your local branch or Young Professionals Network. Both are very active in, in, in Aberdeen. Um, or through one of our social media groups. So that's just a snapshot of some of the key benefits. There are many, many more. So I'd recommend that you, you have a look at our website um, to learn a bit more about those. Great, thanks, Terry. Uh, we've got a question from Robert Barnes. Robert, if you want to... I'm got sorry, your I think my, my, my um, <laughs> thing was above the, um, was above the wrong... Oh, fashion. sorry, okay, yes, so no questions. I'll, I'll withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Okay, one more question from me. Um, uh, so, what what levels of membership and development can members move through to advance help advance their careers? So, so we actually have three introductory grades of membership. Uh, we've got student membership, affiliate membership, and associate membership. Now, that one associate member is actually specifically geared towards people who do want to progress. Um, develop their careers in energy and work towards the professional membership grades and, and registrations. 
for all three of those grades, you can actually join um, online. If you're not already a member with us, it will take just a few minutes, follow the steps through, um, and that will get you immediate access to, to some of those benefits and, and services that I, that, I, that I went through. And when you've got um, some relevant experience under your belt in the energy sector, then you can look at the professional grades, um, such as member, technician member and fellow, um, and all those professional registrations and, and, and charter titles that, that, I, that I touched on. Um, for, for all of those, you, you have to put together a written application. You have to demonstrate some competencies, um, and then that's formally assessed by our membership panel. So there's a bit more involved there. Um, but again, if you have a look at the membership uh, section of our membership page of our website, it actually lists all the different grades that we offer. There's a box for each one. Um, and you can download an application pack um, if you would like to. Great, thank you, Terry. Uh, so uh, next point from us in terms of the, the Aberdeen Highlands and Islands branch, I think we've got the possibly second largest membership in the UK. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm sure it, it, I'm sure it moves around. Um, so we've we decided as a branch to um, we've got a very active committee, um, several of which are on the call at the moment. Uh, so we've We've appointed two um, membership and education advisors, um, Avon and Angela, who are with us on the call. But I just wanted to get a little bit of input from them. So Angela, if I can go to you first. Um, I know you're having problems with your camera, so um, we can well, hopefully we'll hear you. Um, I know you've been quite heavily involved with the EI in terms of you did a, a report for us or as, uh, so uh, if I can talk. So why were you keen to, to volunteer as part of the committee and uh, what what do you do to promote the, the EI to your peers and contacts? I know I know Terry mentioned the mentoring side of things, which I think you're already quite heavily involved with. Okay. Good evening, <laughs> Katrina. Good evening. Um, the reason for me volunteering and for the m and &E role was due to my own personal experience. When I was undertaking uh, the Chartered Energy Manager application at that time, there was no one within the Aberdeen and Highlands branch that I felt I could interact with who had undertaken that specific professional process area. And I wanted to use them as a sounding board, who someone who would have had the relevant experience and knowledge to guide me and advise, advise me on what evidence experience would be beneficial when sourcing and gathering my own evidence for my application. Therefore, when I got my professional um, status, I contacted EI and offered my support to assist others in this area who perhaps like me would have benefited from a like-minded individual who could have talked them through the process or offered guidance, even just in a chat, it didn't have to be particularly very formal. Additionally, EI, as Terry has said, have now launched the national programme, the EI Connect, which is an additional uh, mentoring scheme designed to assist and provide one-to-one -one level support. And that's excellent. It's already out there and it's already operating. However, at branch level, both Yvonne and I are here and we're happy to reach out and assist anyone with any membership queries they require to take them to that next level should they need. Um, to go to the next question you had there for promoting with my own sort of groups, I previously invited EI along to uh, one of my organisation and I work for the Ministry of Defence to provide to present the benefits of EI both to the organisation and for individuals. Now, this is a particular benefit when we look at professional body memberships for future developments and aspirations, and how for annual reports, they can look at goals and where they can take their own recognition moving forward and develop themselves. For my own team, all my team are EI members have or are working towards chartered status. This also supports, supports their role as SMEs, gives them recognition and provides them confidence in a well-known field. The team also benefit from the wealth of the resources, as Terry has said, so I can only say I would highly recommend it to anyone out there, and I do. Thank you. That's great news, Angela. Thank you so much. Um, Avon, if you want to join us back on camera. Yeah. Thank you. So Yvonne is working alongside Angela. So give us a bit of an uh, insight as to Yvonne, why you are an EI member, why you joined the branch and uh, how you feel your membership has been of benefit to you. Right. 
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Katrina, for the question, because it's a question I've, I've often been asked because I'm a corrosion engineer and there is i -Corp, Institute of Corrosion, which is a fantastic organization, by the way. So why did I join EI? And for me, I joined Energy Institute because it's uh, an international organization. You know, it champions innovation and collaboration amongst um, engineering disciplines, you know, operations, management within the energy value chain. And for me, being a member of EI has been it's been fantastic, it's been beneficial, you know, in terms of networking, in terms of information, in terms of knowledge, in terms of exposure to new ideas, you know, such as the energy transition being championed across the energy industry. So I think it's, um, it's fantastic, it's been fantastic for me. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, that's a very uh, a good a good plug to join the EI. So if anybody is on the line and or is viewing this afterwards, then uh, Terry, over to you. Any final comments as to a final um, pitch for us in terms of the EI? Hello again. Um, and not really, no. So I mean, if 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 anyone has any questions, you know, please do ask. Um, there is a specific um, email address um, that you can use to contact um, Yvonne um, and, um, and that's now on the, the Aberdeen branch page of the website. So um, have a look there and, and if you've got any questions or about membership, about the different grades, about the benefits, um, then, then please do ask and we'll, we'll help you as best we can. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that, you've just stole my final plug for the evening in that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Uh, all the, all the uh, upcoming events are on our branch page and you can contact Yvonne and Angela through our new email address or myself, uh, Aberdeen at energyinstitute.org. And um, I know, thank you for everybody for joining us and uh, the recording will be available hopefully in the next few days and record and sent out to everybody. So. Thanks to everybody and have a great evening.